evening, everybody, and welcome to Bible study. We're so glad you're able to come and join us tonight here in the sanctuary, as well as those of you who are watching online. We appreciate each and every one joining us. If you are watching online, take a moment to maybe call or message someone and ask them to watch with you. Uh, and have a good time with Bible study tonight. And as always, uh, feel free to leave any comments that you would like. Uh, we can see those later and say hello to you personally for, for joining with us. Ron, how are you doing tonight? Good. I'm glad to hear it. Good. Good. Was, always do well to do good, right? I was preoccupied. You were doing good. Doing good. Well, uh, got just a few announcements to share with everybody. Uh, as many of you probably already heard this week, uh, Miss Betty Brooks uh, passed away unexpectedly, and, uh, and it's a great loss. We love her dearly, dearly but they're going to be having a celebration of life because we know she's home with her Lord. So mm -hmm. it's a celebration of that, that nature. Um, it'll be this Saturday, which is the 29th at 1 o'clock here at the church. Visitation will start at 11 a.m. and go until the time um, that the service begins at 1. So please be in prayer for her family during this time. Uh, I know she's, they've got folks traveling in uh, for safe journeys and um, that this can just be a time of healing and peace for them. Uh, and this Sunday, we have a very special guest. Brother Bill Kay is going to be preaching for us this Sunday. Always look forward to that. Uh, he's going to be sharing a message titled, The Guardian of Life, Memory. Uh, also, we have back out in the lobby of this church here, we have the baby bottles for the baby bottle blessings. I know it just always says we have baby bottles. There we go. BBB, baby B bottle blessing. They're BBB, that's good. Uh, yeah. But they're available for you to pick up. Uh, proceeds uh, from all the change or other Think checks, cash that you put in the baby bottles will benefit the Ministry of New Beginnings. Uh, please fill these bottles and have them back by Father's Day, which is June 20th. And we got opportunities for people to volunteer. Always room for folks to step in and help in any way that they can. Um, the Alexis Thompson Run is coming up very soon, a week from this Saturday, I believe, June 5th. And we still need volunteers. Uh, to volunteer to go out in the course of the race, sit along the race in some driveways, just to remind folks not to pull out in front of the runners. Um, so you just bring a lawn chair and have a seat, uh, bring something cool to drink, and it's fun to cheer on everybody as they run by, and it will be a great help uh, to help with that volunteering job. And also, we're working to get Colby Kids uh, Jr., this is our toddlers and preschool and infants. Uh, we desperately want to get those started again for families, uh, but we need volunteers to help with that. So if you would be willing to take a Sunday, a rotation, um, to come and help with that, I know Christy, as well as many families here in the church, would greatly appreciate that. If you're interested in any of those things, sign-up sheets are in the lobby, or you can call the church office. And speaking of service and volunteering, Ron's got the shirt on tonight, Serve Win. So we've always had our summer of service uh, projects in which we encourage everyone to get out and find a way that you can serve and help someone in our community. Everybody's got a gift, a talent, um, a willingness to work that can you can do the smallest of things to the largest of things, and it makes a big difference no matter what it is. Uh, but this year, we're excited in that we are going to be working in conjunction with some other churches in the community, and we've all adopted the slogan, Serve, Win, Win standing for Winchester. Um, and so various places for you to volunteer. So if you don't really know what you can do or where you can, if you'll contact the church office, we've got a nice list of places where anyone can go and volunteer. Um, and just make sure if you're already on the church mailing list and email list, if you'll check your email, you'll see you've got some information about that and ways you can serve and ways you can let us know here at the church what you've been able to do. And if you would like to have this dapper T-shirt that Ron has on, we have some out in the lobby that you can pick up uh, anytime that you're here. So isn't that grand? 
lots of stuff going on. I've had two people come up to me about the Lexa Thompson race, and they said, did you, <laughs> did you and the pastor get the ice cream fixed? And I said, yes. Th there you go. The important thing, did you Let get the ice cream? Let me tell you about cream? this. We had a freezer of ice cream last year. Couldn't get the lid up on it. So Alan felt led. He went and got a toolbox. He took all the hinges, everything, anything that had a screw on it, he took off. Took the lock out of it, still wouldn't come up. I said, Alan, we'll never get this back together. Well, the ice cream's in there. I said, well, I can't help that. So we tried to put it back together. Here came little Mary Tabor and said, where's the ice cream? I said, it's in there, but she walked up one hand. <laughs> one of those moments you wish you'd had on film just to catch and to see his face of what? Uh -huh. Ice cream. <laughs> Well, well Ron, say no more until you mentioned Sunday night, the service we had. Oh, I'm telling you, God was Ooh. good. I, I've, I've told everybody the one word I would describe it was freedom. Mm -hmm. There was a sense of freedom to the Spirit, Father, Son, to worship together, uh, freedom to sing, freedom to just be together, freedom We haven't heard that word in a word. while, freedom. Freedom. That's, that's what I felt, freedom. But, yeah, it was a wonderful time for the church family, and I've said it once. I'll say it again. Loved seeing everyone here, but, oh, my heart was thrilled to see this whole section mm -hmm. uh, filled with some of our student ministries, and they were just cheering us on. An altar service? Altar, yes. Like I said, God is so good. We're really blessed. Well, what have you got for us tonight, my friend? My friend. Yes. We have been studying uh, uh, four uh, resurrection appearances of Christ after he resurrected, where he addressed four problems that we could face every day or in the week or in our lifetime for sure, but four just in the Gospel of John. But the first one that he addressed is when Mary Magdalene couldn't find the body and she was crying and weeping. He addressed the problem of sorrow. You have nothing to weep about. I'm here. You have everything to shout about. The second one was when the disciples were in, in fear and they were hiding in this room and he addressed the problem of fear. And then Thomas not being there, he came. We talked about him last week. He came and, he, and Christ addressed the, the, the problem of doubt. He said, okay, we've had sorrow, we've had fear, and we've had doubt. The one we're going to talk about tonight is he addressed the problem of concern. Of concern. And if you want to follow along, it's in John's Gospel, chapter 21. I found out so much studying this the last week. But in John's Gospel, here is breakfast by the sea, and here is where he addresses the problem of concern. And uh, now, I reviewed that, but they knew that Christ had died. They knew he had resurrected. But what now? What now? They knew he had died. They knew he was going back to heaven. But what now? That's where they were at this breakfast at the sea. But in John's Gospel, chapter 21, uh, 1 through 3 said, And after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Galilee. And in, his, and in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. What a time. I'm going fishing. And they all said to him, well, we're going to go with you. And they went out and immediately borrowed a boat, got into the boat. And that night they fished all night and caught nothing. Now, let's talk about this. For years, I thought that they were aggravated, that they were tired. They didn't know what to do. And they had just dropped off. Christ is gone. He's not with them anymore. They did not know what to do. But the disciples to go fishing did not mean anything whatsoever about them dropping their commitment to following Christ and continuing spreading the gospel of the message of Christ that he had to do, spread his message. They knew that he had risen from the grave, but they didn't know what they're going to do now. Now what do we do? We have went through sorrow. We went through fear. We went through doubt, now concern. Now, we're going to have to go back to work. It wasn't that they dropped any of the ministry for Christ. They just didn't know what to do. 
Plus, yet they had not received the instructions to go to Jerusalem and wait for the empowering of the Holy Spirit to come upon them. So they didn't know what this. So at this point, I believe that fishing was a necessity for this man. Some were married. It was a necessity that they go out and provide for themselves and provide for their families. It wasn't a pleasure thing. It wasn't a thing out of being aggravated and something like that. It was going out to provide. Christ had already made provisions for him, but he was gone. And, you know, we go through things in life that I've thought the same thing. Now what am I going to do? Now what am I going to do? But I, I've said so many times, we've got the book, and that's, that's kind of cheating a little bit because they didn't know what he was going to do one day to the next. He's with them three and a half years, and now he's gone. And pretty soon they're going to see him ascend, and they'll know that that's it right there. There were seven disciples there. Now, four were missing, and nobody knows where they were or what they were doing, but they had caught nothing. Now, here is another indication that they were having to go out and to provide for themselves and to provide for the families. Christ was gone. That ministry was over. Three and a half years of that was all over, but they had caught nothing. Verse 4 said, <laughs> verse 4 said, uh, but when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. They had fished all night. They caught nothing. They were tired. They were aggravated. And here's a man over on the shore. They have no idea who he is. And he's just standing over there. Now, Christ was watching them. They weren't watching Christ. There goes back to that illustration you brought up. We have to look up to see Christ because he's already looking down to see us. Christ knew what them men were doing. He was watching them, going after them, and knowing what they were facing and things like that. But it come, the disciples did not know it was Jesus. They probably didn't know where he was going to go, where he had been, where he'd show up. I mean, my goodness, they're hiding. He what comes walking through the doors and things like that. And then the two on the road to, to Emmaus, they, they're standing there, and the two disciples on the road to Emmaus are telling them what they saw, that they had a fellowship with Christ and they broke bread with him and ate with him and then Christ walks in there and eats a piece of fish and honeycomb with them. So, you know, they just never knew what he was going to do and when he was going to do it. But verse 5 said, Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any food? Notice he called them children. Children, have you any food? And they answered him, No. We don't have any food whatsoever. Christ asked him, Christ knew that. He asked them that to pull them out of being worried and concerned about where their meal was going to come. Now, here he's on the bank, and they've already got it ready. But he's trying to get their mind off of quit worrying what's going to come. Take no thought because it's going to be provided. They did not know that, but of making a living. They had worked all night and not made anything. They had experienced in one night <coughs> fear, doubt, sorrow, and concern. In one night fishing, they had done that. Now, again, these men were true fishermen. They knew what they were doing. They made a living doing that. They knew that lake. They knew how to fish, and they knew that they wouldn't catch it. Now, Peter's going to speak up right here, I think, in a minute. But verse 6 says, And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. Hmm. Christ could see what they couldn't see. He always does. There you go. He could see what they couldn't see. And I'm sure they, at night time was the best time for fishing anyway, and they just couldn't thought. But here this guy says, cast over on the right side. Now, I don't have time to go into that, but there is a reason that, that some on the Sea of Galilee that they did sometimes fish on the right side and then sometimes on the left side they would fish according to the wind and things like that. I can't really think about it right now, but. Verse 6, their thoughts was far away from this guy on the bank. Here you got a stranger on the bank. He's dry. He's warm. He's not wet. He's probably full. They probably smell the food that's over there. He's on the land. And here is somebody, tell, you're, here is somebody telling these fishermen how to fish. Now, in Luke's gospel, when Christ told him to go let your net down for a large catch, here you got a carpenter telling a fisherman how to fish. And they knew who he was, but that still had to get on. Here's a man that's on the bank, not even been in the water, not wet or anything, and telling him to cast the net over on the right side. 
John may have realized that this was Christ right then. When he said, cast your net, John, I believe, realized that was Christ's voice. Because he said, launch out into the deep, Peter, in Luke's gospel, when they went for that. Launch out into the deep where the big fish are. There we go. We're going to talk about that launch out into the deep. The deep's scary. Now, if Ronnie Boy was fishing, I'd probably been holding on to the bank or, or, or stick or something holding on. But he knew that it was Christ, and he realized that that was his voice when he said, and right out there, he, I believe he knew that. And it said in verse 6 that, that so they cast, so they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of the fish. I don't know what time span that was. I can't find, and really it's not important what the time span of that was. But it was unable to draw the multitude of the fish here. Now here Christ addresses the problem of concern. I'm, don't be concerned. It's me. Don't worry about things. It's me. It's concern. The fourth problem is the problem of concern. And he knew that that was doing that. Now, when he told them to cast on the right side, they, they did listen to him. But here is, is where Peter really moves. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, and you know I said years and years that bothered me. Why John always <coughs> referred to himself as the beloved, as referred to himself as I'm the one that Jesus loved. Well, what about the other guys? John wasn't doing it in arrogance. He wasn't doing it in boasting. He was humble that someone like him that Jesus would love. And he, I guess you could boast in Christ. Paul said we can't. But he boasted because even somebody like me Christ loved. And <clears throat> when he said, he said, therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. It's here. It's him. Peter probably didn't know it, but I think John knew it. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. Now, some translations say he was naked, not like we think naked. He had taken his outer garment off, and he had his clothes on under it to fish. Now, back during those times, when you were going to meet someone, and you were working like that, you were to put your tunic on and go work them and not just come in, in what I've got on right now. They would have a robe or something else on. But he was not naked, but he put it on because he was going to meet this. But he said he plunged into the water. This could be one of the greatest moments in their life at this particular time. Because he had been with them, addressed three problems, and now they didn't know what they was going to do. Now he addresses the problem of concern. At this time, I can't imagine what a moment that was when they realized that it was him. And when Peter heard that it was the Lord... He took his outer garment off, and he cast himself into the sea. You'd think Peter would be a little gun shy of jumping in the water. Because <laughs> he went up under seven times, or several times he went under. Now, why did he jump into the water? Now, we've got a big thing of fish back here in this net. He jumped into the water. I thought it was really something, and it touched me. Peter didn't jump into the water to help with the fish. He jumped in the water to go to Christ. Hallelujah. He wasn't even looking at the fish. He jumped in the water to go to Christ. He said, that's him. And I guess you could say right now, you know, people say, are you in? Peter was all in right there, brother. He jumped in, and he was going. Uh, somebody asked me when I was telling about this, they said, how deep was that water? Well, I don't know how deep that water was. <laughs> it doesn't matter how deep it was. He jumped in. must have been to the waist. He didn't go in to attend to the fish. He went in to Christ. Now, before that, he was worried and concerned about the fish. They hadn't caught anything all night. Now he's not worried about the fish, but he's concerned. I'm going, that's him. I'm going to Christ, and I'm going to him. And that really touched me this week. But I'm jumping in to go to Jesus, not for the fish. He didn't have any idea what was happening with fish. But the other disciples came, verse 8, in the little boat. Now, that little boat, that's important there. In the little boat, for they were not far from land, about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish in them. Here we go. Now it's getting really interesting here. Other disciples, this wasn't the main ship. It was little boats that was around the main ship that was going about 100 yards out from them. 
and dragging the net of fish. Now, this was a tremendous catch. A tremendous catch in just a short time versus fishing all night. In just a short time, and again, the time span, I don't know. But it versus the whole night of catching nothing. This tells us such as the efforts with Christ versus the efforts without Christ. I'll do it myself. Okay. Didn't do it yourself. I'm going to do it myself. I know how to do it, and I'm going to do it myself. Without the direction and the presence of Christ, we just get repeated, wasted time and failures without him. Without his direction. And does that mean, I uh, say, Lord, I'm fishing, now where should I throw this line? I'm not talking about that type of stuff. But when he spoke to them and told them to cast the net on the right side, the man that was blind and they put mud in his eyes, you know, I would have thought, had that guy know it? He's blind. How did he know it's mud? Guess what? I don't know. <laughs> I think how he knew that could have been mud. He was close to the ground and he had smelled of it. I'm off key, but it's worth talking about. He knew it was mud. Now, if somebody puts mud in my eyes and I'm blind, I've got nothing else to do what he says to go do and wash it out. And then here the whole town jumped on him and said, what's wrong with him? Who is that man? He said, I don't know who he is. But I do know that I couldn't see till I met him, and now I can see. But it's strange that Christ used that mud and put in his eyes back to what God used in creating man. He used the elements that was right there, and he said, go wash. Go wash it out. And the little guy, you know, uh, they jump on the parents and say, is that your son? Well, it looks like it. <laughs> now, if I tell you that's my son, I'm going to be kicked out of the church, and I can't go back to church Sunday. And then finally the little guy says, you know what? If you want to know so much about him, why don't you go back and meet him? Yeah. Hallelujah. I've told you I'm blind now. I can see. I don't know who the man is. But I'm going to say one more second on that. When he walked and he, Christ asked him, said, do you know who did that to you? He said, no, I don't. He said, you're looking at him. Can you imagine? Amy, I wish I had a button to make you shout. Go beep. Woohoo! There we go. There we go. You're looking at him. You're looking at the man. I'm him. I'm him, the one. But a tremendous a catch, such effort with Christ versus effort without him. Now, verse 9, here's where it's going to get interesting. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it and bread. Where'd Jesus get those provisions? Well, if I'd asked my grandfather that, he would have shook his head. It was miraculous, but it was also prepared. Now, we're going to talk about this. It was miraculous, but it was also prepared. And they came to land. Here you got a guy over here that's dry, full, warm, on land, not been out working all night. And you've got these fishermen getting out that's wet, mad, aggravated, hungry. And they're getting out and they're going on to land there with an the empty net. And on the shore, they walk up, and there's a fire. Two times fire's mentioned with the disciples. One time is when, the, um, when, when Peter denies Christ. He was out there warming by the fire. That's the first indication that the disciples were ever cold. And now here, there's a charcoal fire on the bank at this breakfast. But they came, and on the shore, they found it a fire to warm themselves, had a full meal. And it was already prepared. Look at Christ's concern already prepared how did jesus get those provisions now our pastor said that and, and i agree with him he said he could just whistle and fish and jump out and jump into the skillet I, you know that's okay but look what david said in psalms six i'm sorry eight verse six you have made him son of god you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands and you have put all things under his feet all the sheep, oxen, even the beasts of the fields, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas, everything in the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. He just looked at them, and they came up. They probably fried on the way to the skillet. I don't know what they did, but it don't matter. But he said, you know, he prepared it, had it already prepared there. Now, verse 10, I wish we had a time to really talk about this. 
Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Why? Yeah, why? They just they just all had a meal and why did he want them that they just caught? It's already there. He's got something more to teach. Oh, I like that. I like that. There's still a lesson. Why did he want their little fish? But he emphasized that you have just caught. I don't know if they were kosher fish that had scales on them or not. It don't really matter. Probably not. Now, I found this out that I did not know this. Have you ever heard the saying, hook or crook? Hook and crook, or it might be hook or crook. I don't know. It's one of them. I read a, 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 a study to where actually that term that's used today was an old ancient saying, either hook it and crook it. One of the two, like that. I always thought it was, you know, not a good saying, you know, like stealing or something like that. I didn't know what it meant. I had no idea of what it meant. But by saying hook and crook, it originated actually in John chapter 21. Is where that saying, they say that it originated, that that's where that saying came from. A hook is symbolic of a fisherman. A crook is symbolic of a shepherd. Hmm. This was just divine. I don't know where I found this out, but it just really touched me. It's a, for a shepherd. John 21 symbolizes, John 21 symbolizes two ministries of the church. Fishing and shepherding. Had you ever thought about that? I never had. Fishing and shepherding. So many times we say that we're called to be fishers of men, but we never go fishing. <laughs> I used to love to fish until we moved down here by Halls on the River. Why am I going out there in that hot sun fish all day when you go down there and it's already prepared? Don't have to worry about it. Fool with them old nasty worms and everything. And it's already been cleaned. Clean them, yeah. Clean them. Well, I never caught that many that needed that. This is how the gospel is spread. Hooking and crooking. Hook them, fishermen. You catch them in. We don't, we don't get them saved. We catch them. And then hook, the shepherd's hook, and then shepherding. Is that why he wanted those fish to, mm. to them to bring? Help me out because I don't know the answer to it. Is that why he wanted them to bring those fish? I mean, it's already ready, and bring me those fish that you caught. Somebody said, I wonder if he knew how many fish there were. Well, I imagine he did. <coughs> like I said, the pastor said he just snapped his fingers, and they jumped out of the water. They could have. <laughs> but they jumped into their nets. Why did he want that little amount compared to what was already prepared by the master? Hmm. Was it? To show us, show them what you have hooked. Now they're to be crooked. Mm -hmm. You have caught them, and now they're going to be. You need to shepherd them. They're going to have to be shepherded. And I'll get to the one yeah. reason. Go ahead. No, because he said at the very beginning, <coughs> when he called them as disciples to Peter, "I will make you fishers of men." Of men. So it, it, uh, to me, it all goes right back to their original calling that yeah you've caught these fish now what do we do with them like i you don't said, know as you catch or as you minister and help spread the gospel to others the fish fish you bring them to christ right they had to be something mm -hmm. about christ well that was a brilliant statement wasn't it took me this long to realize that when you walk up and you tell two fishermen that are washing their nets, follow me, let's go. And they drop their nets. That was their livelihood. Mm -hmm. It's what they knew. Blind Bar Bartimaeus sitting by the highway side begging. Threw his coat down. Now, I can get excited over Bartimaeus. Threw his coat down and said, I'm not going to need this because I ain't a begging no more because here's the master. Mm. Now, when he did that, blind Bartimaeus and then them... And then I wondered about now, and then you got these two that dropped their nets, not going to fish no more for fish. 
And then they go down here, and here's James and John with their dad, and he's old. And uh, I always wondered what happened to him. They left him in the boat. Christ said, follow me, and they just walked off and left him in the boat. And he was gone. There was something about him when he said, follow me. I don't, I don't know what it was. When he walked up Matthew, he was real popular then, <laughs> tax collector. And he said, follow me, Matthew. Now, I like, I think it's Matthew's account of it said, and Matthew left all, arose, and followed Christ. So what's so special about that? He left it on the table. Mm -hmm. I'm not even going to look back at it. I'm leaving it. He left all, and he arose, and he followed Christ. But something like that, and they just went, and they just did that. But this hook and crook, I like that. Christ didn't want to overlook what they had. Now, here's what you appreciate and you got to do. Now, here's where it starts telling what happened. And in verse 11, Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153 fish. And although there were so many that the net was not broken. 153 fish. A miraculous catch with fish larger than, than that. 153 was a number that was given by the Holy Spirit Put down 153. Now, there's so many things that they say why. They say it's 153. They, they, they say, you know, that uh, 100 was for uh, the Gentiles, 50 for the Jews, and 3 for the Trinity. Uh, another study said that what it was is that they thought that there was 153 different species of fish at that time in the world. So it represented the whole world, species of fish. But 153, now thinking about it, and I have thought about this a lot all of my life, the disciples were caught, they was given 153 for a reason. Now, which one of those could be right, I don't know. But the disciples, just like you said, Amy, were called to be fishers of men, of men not fish. Not fish. Because that was their livelihood. Christ was gone. I believe this was just not a large, mere catch of fish. And it wasn't a collection. It was a purpose. And we know everything God does, there's a purpose to doing it. There's a purpose to that 153 fish. It wasn't a collection. It wasn't just something to boast and brag about. But it had a purpose behind it. Now, 153, I've thought about this so many, many, many times. But to me, that 153 portrays that God is interested in every individual. Mm. Now, here comes 100. If he just said a catch of fish, that's not like saying 153. And this is the only record I know of them ever counting about any fish like that. I have no idea why. But 153, that each soul is precious to God. 153. Now, if it's 153 species all over the world, he's interested in uh, Mesopotamia, wherever that species is. He's interested in individuality of these souls that, that's out there. And I, and I believe that, according to Christ. But so many, yet the net didn't break. Hmm. They say, well, what's so strange about that? Well, it broke in Luke's gospel. Remember, they caught that big catch of fish, and the net broke. Now, boy, here's something I'm letting myself right into the crosshairs of a sight or something like this. So many, yet the net never broke. But then the catch that's noted in Luke's gospel, the net did break. What's the difference? Why did the net not break here with 153 fish? And I don't know how many they had in the other one, but they wouldn't fish this big or that many. And it never broke. What could be the difference? Well, I don't know. At least I'm honest. You are honest. But I'll come up with something. <laughs> oh, when we need our pastor. But anyway, <laughs> we'll hit him with this. In Luke's gospel, Christ had not resurrected yet, okay? Now, bear with me a minute. Hang in there with me a minute. <clears throat> in Luke's gospel, when the net broke, 
Christ had not resurrected yet. Now, in this account of the fish, the great fish and the net not breaking, Christ had resurrected yet. Hmm. Now, the only thing I get into something like that is he's showing there is more yet to come. Hallelujah. Amen to that. Now, they had not been empowered yet with the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost. The net broke before Pentecost. Now, I may be wrong. I may be wrong, but it sounds good. <laughs> but the net broke before Pentecost. But now the net didn't break. And the, the Spirit had not come yet. And uh, the Holy Spirit had not come yet. With the presence of the Holy Spirit and what they were going to do, symbolic to me, it's just symbol symbolically to me, that with the Holy Spirit, our nets won't break. Mm. Now, you know, in, in, in the gospel, they talk about if now if a man has 99 sheep and loses one, uh, one gospel said he'll go to the mountains and he'll find it and he'll come back with it on the shoulders and he'll be uh, praising God and everything and saying, I found my sheep that was lost. But then in Matthew's gospel, the account of the one sheep that's lost said, and the shepherd will go up into the hills or wilderness or somewhere. And if he finds it, Mm. Big difference. May not find it, but if he finds it, he'll bring it home. Mm. Wow. I don't know. <coughs> but that was the only thing I was thinking about. It's going to come because you're going to start catching men. Your life's going to be different. You're going to have the Holy Spirit. You're going to be catching You're going to be hooking and crooking them. <coughs> now, verse 12 says, well, you know, I, I read that about... Uh, Sometimes I just have to let a little <laughs> stuff come out when I probably shouldn't. Here we go. Here we go. But the fish obeyed Christ. Unlike men, fish obey their master. Mm. Peter and them didn't, but now the fish had probably more sense than some of the men did back then. But Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. <coughs> Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They never ask him, come and dine. And, and the original translation says, come, and, come to break, have breakfast. First meal of the day, you know, they always say that's the most important meal. Plus, this already prepared for breakfast. Fire's on there, got bread on there ready, and everything, and got fish on there cooking. Even though Christ was in a glorified state, kind of, he was, he still dined with them. He stayed here long enough to make provisions for them to eat and to dine with them. Now, in Luke's gospel, it says that he ate a piece of fish and honeycomb with that. So, so he ate there. But the big thing about this, even though he was resurrected, even though he was there looking out for him, of all things, what sticks out about this more than anything? He served them. Well, hallelujah. Now, does that make you feel good or bad? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Washing the disciples' feet. He had talked to them and told them, you're called to be a servant. You're supposed to serve. Uh, and he went through all of this deal, and it had to get down, and he had to wash his disciples' feet to show them, you're called to serve. And then, just a, few, just a very short time, he's going to ascend back into heaven. And to be the last thing that he does before he blesses them, before he ascends back, is to serve them breakfast. To have the heart and the humbleness of a servant. My goodness. Look, you died, you resurrected, you're going back to heaven, and you're still serving. Now, I would say that, I would say that kind of, but he still set the, set the example of it, you're to serve. Exactly. It was still a lesson. To us today. To us today and to them at that moment. Still trust. Still believe he will provide, and he cares enough about you to serve and care for you. Go and do the same. Then do the same. Then do the same. Hmm. Which is what he's getting ready to do in the rest of the chapter. He's going to tell him to go do that. I once heard um, years ago when I was younger um, at a camp meeting, and uh, a preacher was was preaching on this, and he he was oh very much so a fisherman, 
And going back to the point of what you said, if here they are on the boat, they're the expert fishermen, right? But if they've been out there all night, like you said, tired, cold, hungry, and they still have nothing, and someone yells out from, <laughs> won't you try the other side? That maybe in their minds they were like, you know, what do we got to lose? We have, it makes no sense to us, but we're going to do it. And they do it, and when these fish start to come in, that it's almost this moment of John goes, oh, <laughs> I think it's the Lord. It's him, oh, oh I think it's the Lord. It's you know, the Lord. It, could it be? And, and again, Peter jumps out, and, you know, and when they, and then even then, I love what the scripture says. They, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. I love that part, too. I, I love that, that part. That they knew their shepherd. I've got one brother. <sighs> I do a lot of woodwork, and he's done none that I know of. And I turned a bowl on a lathe one time, and I was so proud of that. And he looked at it, and he said, well, now, how, here, how come you didn't turn it over and turn it? I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Let me put a block of wood on this lathe. Now, here you show me. Oh, I, I don't know how to do that, but I'm just saying. What do you know? What do you know? Now, somebody could have known, maybe changed my difference, but who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Mm -hmm. Do we get confused sometime and say, I think that was the Lord telling me that? Or he don't even have to speak if we just feel led to do something. And we say, I wonder if it's the Lord. If it's the Lord, you're going to know it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to work out. He's not going to call you into anything halfway in, halfway out. He's going to make sure you're equipped with with anything you want to do or what he wants you to do, provide for you. I saw a question the other day. It just came out of nowhere on, in, on a book. It said, what all have you asked the Lord that you want him to do for you this week? And then it said underneath it, what have you asked the Lord what he wants you to do this week? I turned the page real fast. Oh, made no, me that, feel bad. No, because that's, I think I've shared before, it, especially when I'm uh, at work, at school, my to-do list is is everything. If it's not on that list, I'm likely to forget it or not get it done on time. And I take great satisfaction in taking that pen and checking mm -hmm. off. Check it off. March but through it. But again, did I, how many times do I look at that? God, is this what you want me to do? Is this how you want me to do it? Because when I look at it, I'm just thinking what I, well, see, yeah, true. What I no, need to true. do. That's true. Not what we can, he can do through me. Oh, that's something I, never I need to really that. think about. Now, yeah. Lord, instead of today me asking you what you can do for me, what can, can I, do I do for, for you, you today? What would you have me to do today for you? How can I serve? How can I serve today? But now, like I've said before, you better be careful what you ask him because he may tell you. You need to be like Chick-fil-A. <coughs> How may I serve you today? Right. Right? I got on this kick one time of saying, praying, Lord, search me. Sir, you better be careful because he can do it. He's the man to do it if you want somebody to search you. He's the man to do it. David never asked him too many times, but he asked him a couple of times. None of them ask, who are you? That jumps back to John's gospel. When he's sitting there, I think it's one of the saddest scriptures to me personally that I've ever read. He's sitting at the table. He's told them, I'm going away. Then he finally looks up at him and he said, I've told all of you all sitting here that I'm going away and not one of you have asked me, where are you going? None of them asked him, here, who are you? Because they knew who he was. Did it take the fish? I don't know if it did or not, but whatever it did. Again, I don't think it was the number of 153. I think it was the purpose of it. To show them with Christ what you get is the empty net. Without Christ, you got 153 fish. And reading this whole thing, I thought, I never have to eat fish for breakfast. Have you? 
Yes, I have. Well, there goes my thought. Once, one, yeah. Fish for breakfast. Where? Camping. How? Camping. Oh, camping? Mm -hmm. With my brothers. Only we went one time. I have to say, well, I'm, I'm more of a glamping person than a camping person. I learned on that trip. Did you but have fish gravy? No. Okay. Just okay. the fish my brother caught and put in the pan. Pork. Mm. And that they also never asked me to go camping again. <laughs> <laughs> we learned. We learned our lesson. <laughs> to get deep, do people still ask that today? Who are you? Who are you? Now, I can sit by myself and get to thinking. And uh, I said this one time in a meeting, and it didn't go over good at all. I said, I don't know Christ. I don't know Christ. Well, that'll get Christians' attention. They'll turn around and look at you. What do you mean you don't know him? I don't know him. Paul said that I may know him and the power of his reign. When I say that, I don't know him, what he's going to do today, tomorrow, this afternoon, tonight. I don't know. But whatever it's going to be is just what I need. And, you know, since we've been having these, I have studied, I will have to say I've studied harder and longer than I ever have. And I've even asked myself, who are you? Who are you sometimes? Who am I sometimes? And it's drawn, this lesson drew me closer to Christ this week in thinking of where I'm at. I felt like one of them 153 fish in that net caught and couldn't get out. But where I'm at and what the purpose was. It doesn't say anything about him eating that 153 fish. Not one thing. He just said, bring them up here. And that's your homework to find out what they did with them fish. Now, verse 13 says, Jesus said, come and eat breakfast. It's ready. Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples asked who we were. But Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And likewise, the fish. Did he eat? But he met every need they had. Like you said, you started out saying they still had to provide. He provided in abundance. Look at, look at the symbolism in there. The bread, Jesus Christ. I am the bread of life. The fish, the meat, the word of God. The meat, the fish, the meat, the word of God. The net, the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit that will catch men and catch fish. The sea, the world, the world. The ship, us. An empty, remember said that he walked by the, he walked by the lake one time and there was two boats, no, nothing was in them. They were just standing there doing nothing. The boat is symbolic. The boat and the fishermen is symbolic of us, the church, to get in there and fish fish for men and crook for men. <clears throat> the 153 fish, I don't know how many. I didn't take any courses in college fishology or anything like that. <laughs> but I don't know how many fish species they were. But they said they could have been at that time 153 species of fish in the Lake Sea of Galilee and the world. Regardless, the 153 is symbolic of every soul in the nation, in the sea, wherever. Nice. God is interested in them. He is interested in that number of just one. But Christ shows himself again by being there. Christ the servant. He wasn't, a, he wasn't a famous person in the world's eyes at a feast. He was a resurrected Christ sitting on the banks of the Sea of Galilee cooking fish and serving the fish that he could. And verse 14 said, <clears throat> now, this is the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Hmm. Third time. Now, in conclusion, here Christ addresses our problem of concern. What are you worried about? I'll take care of it. I've already got it. I'll take care of it. What are you concerned about? I will take care of it. But in the book of John, he addresses sorrow, fear, doubt, and concern. He's all I need, hmm. and he can do it. <coughs> that sounds great. You know, I wonder, too, you mentioned my mom was just thinking here, scary thing. Um, again, in the previous fishing expedition, 
net was so full, the fish that got away. And you always hear the, that's a fisherman's tale. Oh, but the one oh, that yeah. got away. And like this <coughs> time that they, it didn't get away. And maybe it's that they wondered how many fish got away the last time. And this one, every single one was accounted for. Like fishermen, what you bring in, that was their livelihood. Maybe it was that number had a significance to them. We talk more about mm. the fish that got away. Than the ones we got. What about the ones we got? Exactly. Focus what on the What do we ones. do? Hook them and crook them. We fish them and we shepherd them. But we talk about the ones that got away. But what about these that we've got here? Now, you know, I talked about the parable of the lost sheep, the coin, and the son. Well, uh, you know, people take offense to that sometimes. They'll say, well, you mean to tell me all of heaven rejoiced over that one sinner, God, that, that over 99 that was safe? You had your day. They rejoiced over you at your day. Now, let somebody else have some fun doing it. But I like that what you said, though, about that we concentrate too much on the fish that got away and the shepherd to but, do that. But not a one of these got away. Not a one of the 153 got away. Who knows? Maybe there was a record catch and this beat it by all records, 153. 153 fish. Now, Who I, would, knows? I would say these 153. Somewhere there in Galilee, there's a little <laughs> bait shop and there's a little picture. A little the, fish looking yeah, at us. Yeah, a little net. Biggest catch ever. 122 until 153. You never know. But what it, like you said, no matter what it means, it's significant in that they were all there, all accounted for, and provided for. I was one of the 153 at one time. Mm -hmm. You know, we can put, plug our names in this Bible anywhere. Every time I read where, and it said, Christ crossed to the other side. Thank God he crossed the other side to get me. That's where mm -hmm. I was. When they went over to the demon, uh, the mnemonic of the maniac of Gadara, man, they was having a revival over here. Fried chicken and everything. They was having a ball over here. And Christ <laughs> said, let's go over there. They didn't want to go over there. Let's cross over to the other side. I was one of the 153, and I was one on the other side. And I don't know if it's going to be next week or the next week, but uh, our headmaster here, the headmaster, teacher. We, we say head of school. She's going to be giving uh, the Apostle Peter a pass <laughs> or fail grade. <laughs> We're going to give Peter an exam, and you're the headmaster. You got it. I'm out of it. You're out of it. I'm out of it. I'm cleaning fish. Do you want me to grade on a curve? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, dis could. we'll discuss the provisions of that later. I always said the later. curve in school. I was known as the curve. <laughs> this is... I'm instantly hearing all the things in my head when you say we're going to have a quiz. Do we get to have a small note card of notes? Do oh. we get to make corrections for extra credit? There's always a question before they even get a question. Anyway, well, I'm telling you, this is another great lesson. We well, thank, thank you. Thank you, too. You, too. Thank you for making us think about things in a different way and think the way Christ would have us to think and open our eyes. And the more we study, the more he can speak to us. How could something that happened over 2,000 years ago apply to Ronnie Boy today? That's the power of the gospel. That's the gospel. You know, I can read it's books. powerful. I can read Bill Kay's books real fast, kind of. But now to sit down and read this, uh-uh, not the whole book. Well, it's not I don't a, think anybody can do it. It's not an overnight reading kind of assignment. You got to stew in it a little bit, right? Read and let it sink in. Well, you've convicted me. I'll never go fishing again. <laughs> I'm not going. <laughs> I, I only went fishing once, and it was on the same camping trip. I haven't done that either. <laughs> 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 I go to the fish market. <laughs> Long John's. Captain Here we Dean's, go. Paul's. Well, before we close out tonight, let, let's have a time of prayer. And like I said at the beginning, we were talking about uh, Betty Brooks and remembering her family. Janine Voris has been taken to the hospital. She um, <coughs> is having trouble with her O2 level and everything. And, uh, but she is improving. I talked to her. I'm going to call her after church. But 
uh, call her daughters, but she is improving. But they, it was a little scary this morning they took her, but she is improving in the emergency room, and, and we'll let the church know more about it. Okay. Betty Brooks, what a lady. Wonderful. Yes. I don't know if I've ever seen anyone as faithful in prayer requests than Betty. Mm. So many things that she was incredibly faithful. I remember all my years in coming to church here up until just recently when it came time for our foot washing service. Oh. It was Betty who had all of that ready to go. Ready to go. Mm -hmm. Communion. Communion. Again, faithful in so many we, things. We would pray for her, and she would come and introduce me to one of her friends or something and say, tell my friend here that uh, you prayed a prayer for me that you have never prayed for anybody in your life. I said, okay. I know what it is. What? That she would gain weight. Help me gain weight. <laughs> I've never prayed for anybody to gain weight in my life. Uh, but I did her, and it worked. It, and she gave she testimony weight. of it, too. God love her. Yes. God Last time did. I saw her was getting those COVID shots. I told her, I said, I ain't getting it. I'm backing out. She said, you get over and sit down and take it. And I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know there's many others um, that may have needs. And uh, no matter what they are, as we pray right now, just Jesus, lift those up. Jesus, Jesus. Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you for this time that we can get into your word, learn more about you, think about yes. things in a different way. And God, what, what we have heard tonight, what we have read, what we've experienced, I pray it takes root, and that as we go out the rest of this week, and, and we're asking, God, what would you have me do today? Mm -hmm. Who can I serve today? How can I serve them? And to remember, each one matters to you. Right. And that you answer every prayer according to your will, and that you provide when we're concerned. You can give faith for doubt. Yes. You can give sorrow. Mm. Uh, you can give joy for sorrow. All of these things, God, you're the answer if we will just seek you first. Hallelujah. Uh, God, we do thank you for the incredible times of worship we've had in the sanctuary of late. And uh, last Sunday night, just giving time of Amen. praise uh, to you, God, for bringing us through such a difficult time, yes. uh, not only as a church community, but in the world itself. Uh, and we know there are still countries and areas uh, with significant battles they're facing. And we just pray, God, um, that they too will have this relief that is, has come here to our nation yes. as we're beginning to heal. But I pray, God, that we don't forget and we remember that you are the provider. Amen. And that you sustained us when things seemed unsustainable. Yes. And, Lord, we think now of, of Betty Brooks's family. Um, this is just, even though we celebrate that she is in the presence Hallelujah. of the Lord at this moment, She's not with her family right now, and that, that leaves a big hole. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to fill that, and only you can. And so, God, we just pray that they realize it's okay to have times of, of, of sadness, that they miss her and long to have her here to talk to her again. Um, but, God, I just pray that over time you, you replace that sorrow and that emptiness with, with your joy and completeness. And just be with them through this time. And I pray, God, just as we were able to share yes, these yes. wonderful things about how she was a wonderful servant of God, how she was so kind and loving to everyone, that this will bring them great comfort during this time. Yes, yes. I pray for Pastor Allen and Brother Bill as they will be leading uh -huh. that service. God, just give them the words of comfort and hope uh, that they can share with the family as well as everyone who gathers for the service. We think of Janine and how she was uh, had to go to the hospital today, and I'm sure that was really scary. And we just pray, God, that you continue to touch her. Yes. She remains faithful, and she remains hopeful in you, and we know you will provide. Yes, yes. Whatever other needs, God, that we have right now in our hearts and our minds, whatever it may be, God, we just need to lay it at your feet. We need to trust you. And I pray, God, that each morning hereafter that we do start our day, with Lord, we praise you for yet another day. And God, how can we serve you today? Yes. We love you and thank you. Amen. Amen and good night. We'll see Amen. you Sunday at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. on Hulu.